Thanks, Ken. That's great. Thanks, everyone, for, for uh, attending. Can you hear me at the back? Cool. That's One good. Thumb. Yeah. One thumb. <laughs> OK, so today I'm just going to tell you a bit about how uh, we're building catastrophe models using open data and uh, open source. So I work for, I'll tell you in the next slides, I work for a, a reinsurance broker. So I'll tell you a little bit about reinsurance. Who knows about reinsurance? Put your hand up. I recognize a face. OK, yeah, another people too. Great. And uh, who, who's ever used a catastrophe model before? OK, a few. OK, great. So I'll talk about how we uh, build catastrophe models, a bit of uh, how we're using open source and open data for the purposes of developing the model and also for visualization. And in the previous days, just before FOS4G or on Tuesday and Wednesday, there was uh, the AGI conference in the UK. And their theme this year was um, making things open for business. So I thought I'd bring that into the equation too. OK, so reinsurance is really just insurance for uh, insurance companies. So we need insurance, um, and then a big disaster can occur, and uh, the insurance company can't afford to pay anybody. So then they get reinsurance. Um, I am Benfield. We, we are uh, brokers, essentially. We, we uh, sell reinsurance to, to reinsurers. Oh, you might have heard, you might have seen us before. I don't know if anyone, maybe not the guys from the US. I don't know if you follow uh, soccer, football. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've got, uh, we're basically a part, of the, part of the Aon group, so we sponsor Manchester United. And the, the, the part that we do um, is, is this reinsurance broking. So within Aon Benfield, the analytics team do the catastrophe management where uh, one of those functions in impact forecasting, this little logo here, um, I've actually got some socks that are branded like this. I can show you later on. Uh, we develop catastrophe models. So the team, there's about 60 of us worldwide. Uh, we're catastrophe model developers. And we're building the platform called Elements. This is uh, where we run our catastrophe models for uh, different perils, earthquake, flood, windstorm. And we've been de developing that for about, about four years. So what this lets you do, lets the user do, is to put in uh, insurance uh, portfolios, so information on where the sums insured are for different houses and different buildings, and give an estimated loss for any, any uh, a probability of a certain event. So the components, I'm going to get onto the open bit soon. Don't worry, it's coming. Um, but with the catastrophe modeling, really, we've got three, three key components. We've got the, the hazard component, the vulnerability, and the exposure. So within the hazard, uh, we might be looking at things like, uh, for earthquake, the shaking intensity. So um, if an earthquake happens in a certain place, what's the intensity of shaking at a location uh, close to that? For, for windstorm, we're talking about wind speed, uh, wind strength. And then for flood, it might be the flood depth or the flow velocity of the flood. Uh, the next bit about the vulnerability, that's how a building or a, a structure would respond to, to uh, a, a catastrophe. So um, the, the damage that might, uh, might occur. So different buildings will respond very differently. Um, we've got, for windstorm, a greenhouse that would get damaged very quickly compared to something with a, a bit more robust, maybe. Then exposure. This is the bit that really defines uh, some of the risk, you know, the, the portfolio. So things like the building, uh, the, the, the sums insured, how much is insured at each location. Um, the maybe. Uh, in some cases, if, if it's life insurance, the number of people that are living uh, or in a certain uh, location. And then together, these three components kind of come together in a cat catastrophe model, and the output is the loss calculation. So giving a monetary figure for the, the, um, the potential losses for an event. So I guess why people are using catastrophe modeling is to help them uh, help insurers and reinsurers price their catastrophe cover. So to say, this is how much money we need to keep if an event happens to, to pay people out. They were formed um, over the last 25 years, really. Started um, in, in the US and uh, following Hurricane Andrew, um, but also the European windstorms of the late 80s and early 90s. We've uh, seen since, so we're normally natural perils, things like uh, earthquake, flood, and windstorm, but then also some man made perils. So, following the World Trade Center attacks, things like terrorism models have been started to be developed too.
Um, so people that use catastrophe models as insurers and reinsurers, uh, I'll move on to later about some other people that might, might be, might or could use catastrophe modeling. Um, has anyone heard of the, the top three, AIR, Equicat, and RMS? Put your hand up if you have. OK. OK, great, thanks. Um, so yeah, these are the big three, three, three commercial modeling companies um, out of the box. You know, anyone can use that software. Um, we're developing this one uh, in, in impact forecasting elements. OK, so here we go, on to the open. So we've got um, open standards, obviously, open data, and open source software. And I'll show you in the next few slides how we're using uh, a combination of all of these uh, in, in the things that we're doing in the model development and in the visualization of the, of the models also. OK, so with the uh, first slide on model development, when we're creating the model components, each of these uh, hazard vulnerability and exposure, we're um, really developing the model components using open source a lot of the time. And we're often finding it's faster, it's uh, more efficient, and uh, it's obviously, in some cases, uh, cheaper. Um, so some examples, we've got uh, a, a footprint map here for an individual event. Uh, now, I'm not sure if you can see, but there, there's, these, uh, these are individual dots. So this is a kind of calculated footprint on a, on a one kilometer grid uh, for Turkey. And the earthquake team uh, were quite proud of that because we can match. This is the, these zones, the, uh, the polygons there, that's the, uh, uh, from the USGS, like, did you feel it? So an earthquake occurred, people go in and say, we felt uh, this intensity in this area. So the dots are the modeled output. So we're closely matching what, what people felt um, for, for that earthquake. Um, so in this visualization, we used a bit of uh, Python with um, matplotlib and, and base map as well. Um, the next thing we want to do is not just look at a single event, but look at hundreds of thousands of events. And that's <coughs> where we build up this uh, probabilistic uh, event set, a uh, stochastic event set. So when we're creating hundreds of thousands of footprints, you can um, imagine that's pretty, pretty computer you know, uh, processor intensive. Um, and we're using Python, Python to do that. The next thing we want to do with all those footprints is to say, well, these are the, these are the um, regions or zones, these are the admin zones that that earthquake affected. And that's where we bring it all together into a, a, a thing called a master table, which I'll show you uh, in the coming slides. And we're using um, R to do that with a, a weighted quantile um, function, which I'll show you in a second. A um, bit of theory just behind that. So, this is used in all the models that we develop in earthquake and flood and in windstorm. Um, this example is for earthquake. So you can imagine we've got an administrative zone there. We, we've got a commercial building, and we know it sits somewhere in that admin zone. We don't know quite where. So using uh, population density, uh, population, um, we're using land scan, actually, so one kilometer population grid. So 90% of the time, we think that we're going to place the commercial building in the city. 9% uh, of the time in a... In a, in a larger town, and then 1% of the time the commercial building might be in the, uh, might be in the woods. Um, so in this example, an earthquake occurs, so we've got a magnitude uh, 7.6, and then we've got different intensities felt at different locations, so different amounts of shaking, effectively. Um, so this, this kind of concept, um, I'll just show you another example, so another earthquake occurs, different intensities are felt again. So this is where we basically weight the hazard. So we're saying it's more likely to affect um, places within the administrative zone where there, are, where there are more people, effectively. This is all down to data. I mean, if we could get data on a very accurate level, that would be great. But often we get aggregated data. So aggregated to a region, uh, aggregated to a large, large administrative area. Um, so I was mentioning the R weighted quantile method. And that's used to generate this, this uh, the output of of that kind of theory, and, and um, um, this gives you the, for each event, we have the administrative zone it affects, and then the probability of a certain intensity. So you can see you're getting a, a, uh, a lower probability of, uh, of higher hazards, moving, down to, to, moving up to a um, higher probability of, of a lower hazard, going down to you know, no hazard uh, most of the time. Um, so that's, that's one example. This is a bit more graphical, for, just for floods, just showing you how we bring it together. So we're showing uh, flood extent here, uh, have some postal codes, and then we're looking at uh, just one event in this case, uh, and then the administrative zones it, that that event affects. So in these models, we've got these tables are made of millions and millions of rows because we've got hundreds of thousands of events, and each one affects a certain number of zones. So it gets pretty big pretty quickly. 
Okay, so moving away from the open source and onto uh, open data, I guess we're making use of open data in a variety of ways for the models we're, we're creating. Um, I made a new word up there, freeness, um, but I guess it, it really depends on different levels of uh, freeness, for, you know, whether it's for personal or educational or, or commercial use, can we use it? Um, can we use the data? Is it suitable for what we're trying to do? If we want to do an in-depth scenario model, um, maybe we, we, can't, we can't use um, open data. It's not, uh, maybe it might not be detailed enough for what we want to do. Um, there was a link that uh, I think has been going around, but uh, done by a guy um, in the UK. So it's got a list of about three or 400 open data sources. Um, so you could visit that link. I guess the slides will be made available later. Um, so some examples, I guess, with the we're, we're currently developing um, a, a tsunami model f for Chile, and that makes use of SRTM data. So that's an open uh, worldwide data source of terrain, 90, <coughs> 90 meter, uh, uh, basically a grid with elevation values, um, and that really we, we went with that because we wanted to, we were creating a countrywide model and. Um, it was it was basically the only option. There were a lot of other options which were much higher cost and would would probably have had uh, implications for for processing and so on. So other sources of uh, well, some of the other sorry proprietary data sources we're using uh, people like Ordnance Survey here in the UK using some of their data, uh, TomTom, uh, GFK, and uh, LandScan I mentioned a bit earlier, um, and then some of the open sources so SRTM, uh, USGS produce uh, VS30 which is very useful for uh, soil modifiers for earthquake models. We're using Corine, which is a land use data set for Europe. Um, Ordnance Survey also offer open data sources, so we're making use of those. And we're starting to get into the use of uh, OpenStreetMap and some of the points of interest data um, there as well. Okay, so in terms of visualization, we're, we're um, using a variety of open source tools for the visualization. So a mixture of um, well, really, what we've just created this tool called Elements Explorer, and what that does is let you map the outputs from the model. So I'll show you some examples in the next slides. And this is built using GeoServer and Open Layers. Um, we've got an o OpenStreetMap background mapped to the to the uh, solution, and we're also serving the data out as uh, web map services and creating pretty heavy um, style files, so kind of one and two gigab uh, sorry one and two megabyte uh, SLD files. Um, to allow users to change classifications um, of the data they, they see and things. So the other thing that we do, I guess, yeah, with open source, we're allow uh, it's allowing us to get into the nuts and bolts of, of uh, you know, underneath, underneath the hood, really. Um, and we're also much more e easily able to extend, extend the software, too. Um, some examples, three of them are from the Czech Republic. My boss is from the Czech Republic. Um, but this is some of the output of the tool. So, the, the top left, we can see we've got uh, the average inundation depth per postal code for uh, one event from the Austrian flood model. So you can see it's built on open layers here. Um, and all that's giving you, yeah, it's just a flood depth per postcode for, for, for that event. On the right here, we've got, uh, top right, we've got uh, the average annual loss. Um, so in insurance, they kind of refer that as, uh, to that as the burning cost. So I guess what that lets the insurance company do is try and work out, well, which areas are more at risk than others. I mean, you couldn't say the absolute values mean something, but at least it's, it's relative. You know, higher numbers mean there's more likely a bigger risk there. Um, bottom left, we've got exposure. So we can take a, a, a portfolio, just do a simple map of, of where the insured locations are on, on a map. And then the bottom right here, we've got a uh, similar to the top left, but this is... Um, looking at a specific scenario event uh, and showing what the, the total loss is per region. So the, the tool lets you look at kind of multiple geographies as well, you know, postcodes, uh, districts, municipalities, um, and regions as well. Also, just to mention, we're also using not just open source, uh, using some proprietary tools too, so um, a bit of ArcGIS, um, Global Mapper, that's a really great uh, low-cost GIS tool. Does anyone use Global Mapper? Okay, maybe more, but you don't want to admit it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, Google Earth as well, and uh, Pitney Bowes we're using for some of the geo geocoding solutions too. So 
We're kind of using a mixture of, of, of open source and, and proprietary tools. So the, the, the second point, which um, is really just to, or another point I wanted to make in the presentation is trying to make uh, our models open for business. A lot, I guess in the past, a lot of, uh, and, and still to this day, some of, the, some of the catastrophe modeling software is kind of black box. You can't really see into it and see what's happening. Um, I hope this isn't too much of a sales pitch, but the thing that we do, we like to, uh, with Elements, say that we can really kind of see inside uh, the model and see what's happening. So we can change components if we want to. And that's where this slide comes in, really, just to kind of show the software as a bit of a, a bit like a shape sorter. So you can change the hazard, the exposure, the vulnerability, and the portfolio information, and, and see the effect that has. So, um, for example, with vulnerability, if, if you wanted to, uh, you didn't know the type of uh, buildings that you were insuring, which happens quite a lot, um, you can make an assumption. Maybe they're not made of stone. Maybe they're made of reinforced concrete. You could make that assumption, run the model again, and uh, get, get some new, new results out of that. So I guess this is also true for the other catastrophe models as well. I mean, they're used throughout the insurance and reinsurance industry, but um, there are many other potential users. So really, government agencies, emergency planners, um, looking at kind of what-if scenarios, if this event were to happen, um, a catastrophe model could give you an output, could help with evacuation planning and so on. Uh, humanitarian agencies. Uh, also, commercial businesses and academic institutions, they might want to take a model and use it for a slightly different purpose, uh, all those sorts of things. I guess the other point is that we're making use of both open, open data, proprietary data, open source and proprietary software with, with what we're doing. So it's, I guess it's a mixture of uh, the knowledge that people have got within the team that we, uh, we have um, and also the best tools for the job. So if we can find something from the open source community, um, that, 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 that um, helps us, then we will use that and obviously contribute, contribute back also. So I guess just in summary, um, catastrophe models will allow you to better understand your, your risk to, 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 to catastrophes. Uh, we can build the components using open data and open source. Our, the open data sources we're using, they're especially useful for some of the countrywide models we're doing. Um, where we need a kind of general general view of catastrophic risk um, rather than a scenario model that might be much more detailed. The open source uh, software really can help us speed up big data tasks. We saw with uh, where we're using Python to, to compute uh, hundreds of thousands of, of earthquake footprints. Um, Python's really helped us uh, speed up that task. Um, with visualization, we're using GeoServer and open layers and uh, with uh, some of the open standards as well, WMS and, and SLD also. Um, and also, this, just this final point that, that you know, catastrophe models are really used in insurance, but maybe we could be using them in, in many other sectors and industries. So, um, saying we're, we're open for business. Um, so, yeah, thank you for, for uh, listening. And if you have any uh, questions, then cool. uh, that'd be great. Thanks. Thanks. I raced you've through that. You've left yourself wide open there. No, no. Uh, so, who would like to kick off the questioning? I sort of probably two, two quick questions. Is, is one is a great presentation that I've caught all my eyes for the insurance, but I've never seen that I've never seen it before. Okay. So, two quick questions. Is one is how do you balance uh, being open with your models and at the same time uh, protecting you know your IP to some extent? And secondly, as you're mixing and matching. You know, open source, proprietary. Mm. You know, how do you? What is your strategy to deal with you know the, the different licensing um, minefield that's out there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess with with the yeah with the first point about, I, I guess what we're using open source to, to develop the components. So I guess the, the <coughs> final product. Um, so whether the web mapping component is still open. So we're you know we're kind of putting that back into the, into the community, but the. The actual software elements is still a it is built on C sharp and SQL Server, so there's still a mix, that's the proprietary bit. So yeah. the actual tool, um, yeah, w w you, you know, someone couldn't go away and extend that. I mean, that, that's something that's done by us. But I guess the components, you know, the things that we're doing to build the inputs to the model, and that's where the, the kind of open source comes in. Um, second point with licensing, yeah, I guess it's um, it's. Sorry, repeat that question again. <laughs> you know, you're mixing and you're, yeah. you're bringing together you know, proprietary and open source. 
you know, how are you guys keeping track of or dealing with, you know, the licensing issue of what you can and can't use, what you can mix and match, you know, give strategy. Yeah. yeah. I guess, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I guess it's a communication thing. I mean, within the, within the group, we have uh, different peril leaders. So we've got, uh, you know, earthquake leader, um, um, you know, within this, you know, kind of 60 of us, um, windstorm, flood, you know, terror and so on. And then I guess it's really just communication. So between, we're in London, Prague and Chicago, um, just talking between us and making sure we're, if we're purchasing licenses, are we doing it for, the, for the, all of us at once? And is that, is, that, um, is that a good idea? Do we want to do it on a country level or a, a kind of worldwide level? Um, but it's just communication. So, I, you know, making sure we've got a, a handle on what we're, what we're licensing, what we're not, and um, getting rid of stuff that we, we might not use anymore, that kind of thing. I hope that's kind of answered it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's something that really the, 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 the software is kind of agnostic. It could be dollars, potatoes, peoples, uh, people, any, anything. So that's something we're, we're uh, also looking at. So that's something that maybe, you know, a use could be for uh, in academia is to take, uh, take the model, which is very much used for monetary values, and say, okay, well, let's develop it for looking at, you know, loss of life or something like that. Um, um, yeah, so absolutely, that's something that w it, the components are the same, really. I mean, rather than a... Um, you know, the, the hazard is obviously the same, but then w instead of looking at kind of damage to buildings, it would be to, to um, people and populations instead. So I think the framework's there. It, it just needs adapting, really. Yeah. And I just question. Yeah. Um, I was just interested, the, the models that you're uh, using, are they based on published papers or are they developed yourself? And uh, how, you know, are the models actually open with the, the, you know, the, the algorithm? So it's it's a mixture, and um, it depends on on the, the the team. So we're kind of working. I guess I could use an example. We uh, just developed a European windstorm model, um, and that was done with the University of Cologne. So um, some of the you know the science behind the model it comes from academia, and we're working in kind of conjunction with them. And then other models we might be developing it in house. So uh, and then yeah. So I guess I'm in the earthquake team. So some of the uh, attenuation functions to describe the kind of level of shaking and so on. Um, we, we'd get from, you know, use from academic papers and obviously reference those and so on. So, um, yeah, it's, we, so I guess we're using already, a lot of the time we'll be publishing papers about that and then if not, we will have used already published sources for some of the science behind it. Yeah, there isn't, no, um, at the minute. So I guess you mean from the site, uh, from the saying, so these are the algorithms. There isn't for elements. Now, A and Benfield are also involved in a thing called Oasis. Um, and that's where the, the kind of community is getting together. And uh, so catastrophe modeling, insurance and reinsurance are getting together and making some of the kind of science behind catastrophe modeling. So some of the theory, so like you're talking about algorithms behind some of the components. Um, more open. So that's, uh, if you look up Oasis, um, I think it's oasislmf.org, and Aon Benford are kind of part of that too. And that's about trying to um, really document some of the processes behind the catastrophe modeling. So, um, and that's, that's uh, covering kind of uh, hazard, <coughs> vulnerability, and, and, and uh, loss as well. So, but, yeah. Do you feel any sort of institutional inertia against using sort of open source software? And how, how do you resolve that? How do you get really nice and accepted? I'm not sure fuzzy feeling about the whole process. Yeah. As opposed to thinking, oh, it's open. Ah. Mm, yeah. I think we're. I think we're quite lucky in the team that we're in. I mean, we're a, a bit like an R and D department in a way. So, um, you know, the kind of the guy that makes the decisions is kind of you know is my boss, and, and it doesn't go much further than that. I think so. I mean, if we need, you know, if we can find the best tool for the job, and the best tool is open source, then there's no issue with, you know, it's really just finding the best tools for the job. So, um, in a lot of cases, that is open source rather than proprietary, but it'll depend on the on the situation. So I think we can just run with it. I mean. Um, a lot of these projects we're doing a very short time span, and we need to kind of get get something uh, 
out very very quickly um, and, and it's I, I guess yeah quite uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah things are fast paced so we can just go with go with the flow or something <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you're using open data collected from many sources I suppose governments and so on yeah but um, some open data is good some open data is bad yeah do you have a way to evaluate the quality of the data and yeah <coughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess I could use the example of the, the you know, SRTM is quite a, a coarse terrain mm -hmm. data set, and we were using that for um, some of the tsunami modeling that we're, we're doing in, in Chile. And um, yeah, I mean, really what we were trying to do is, is, is uh, w we had some field survey data, so that was a great, great uh, way of being able to kind of match, you know, to, to verify how good the data was. Um, so that, that helped us kind of, you know, in some cases have to, you know, correct, correct the terrain data as well. So that's, that's one example. I mean, I guess it's just trying to, if you've got, if you've got open data sources, just try and um, if you've got other, you know, other bits of, inf of, of source of information, you can kind of cross-reference and so on. So we, can, we do that as much as we can, really. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask, surely you, um, by using coarse data, as you just put it, mm. there is a risk that your models are going to be slightly incorrect. Yeah. Surely the cost of that inaccuracy <coughs> is far more devastating to you as a business than paying for better data. I think that it's really, I mean, it's really down, it, you know, different situations will dictate what, what we use. and. Um, I think that you know, within a, with every model we create, we're obviously we're documenting the whole process and saying, well, these are the assumptions. I mean, like any model, you make a series of assumptions, and whether they're, um, you know, I mean, and, and those can be you know assumptions about the data. So this is the data we're using, and this is all we've got. So this, you know, at the end of the day, we need. Uh, I mean, if the only other option is to put your finger in the air and say, well, we think you should be purchasing this much insurance, then then uh, I guess. Even a course model is better than better than no model. So, um, but I think yeah, it, like you say, I mean, it, if there is better data there, and w w you know we've got the time um, and, and the money to, to, to use it, then we will. Um, but it, again, it, I mean, there's also other implications for using, um, you know, less coarse data, you know, more refined data. There's processing overheads and so on. So, especially with terrain data and flooding, I mean, you can go down to a one meter DTM, but then you've got to spend two and a half years processing it or something, so, yeah. Okay, final question. How, so you're, s you're selling <coughs> reinsurance to the direct insurance market. Yeah. That's what this, these tools are for. How closely coupled are you to the pricing models? Is it built into these models or is that a totally separate? So, so the outputs of our model would, would go into uh, something, you know, like dynamic financial analysis tool. So um, from this tool, Unfortunately, if I show, show, showed that on a slide, I mean, you can get uh, a loss per event from the model, uh, and that information would feed into a, a pricing tool. So it would say, you know, I don't know, 100,000 events, these are the, these are the uh, financial losses, uh, with a standard deviation um, for each, for each uh, uh, event and for each, uh, each loss on each location. That kind but of is it, is, are those two systems loosely coupled or, or tightly? They're I mean, they're loosely coupled. You take an output from this and put it as an input into the next tool. So, it, I mean, it, this is, you know, the outputs of this are ready for the next, for the pricing tool, <coughs> essentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you right. very much. Once Thank again. you.